Hello, young soul. Welcome to the Daily Horror Channel. If you are afraid of real and scary reports, this channel is not for you. I suggest you leave this video. But if you are not afraid of listening to these horrifying reports, I suggest you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next stories. In an isolated village, there is a lake surrounded by a fog of mystery and fear. For generations, stories of mysterious drownings have fueled local legends. Many believe the lake is cursed, harboring vengeful spirits of those who met their end in its treacherous waters. When a new resident arrives in the city, looking for peace and a fresh start, he decides to investigate the truth behind these stories. He will soon discover that the horrors of the lake are more real and terrifying than any legend would suggest. I am Raphael, a 32-year-old man, trying to escape the shadows of the past. I left the hustle and bustle of the big city and moved to the small village of Elderville, seeking peace and tranquility. The little town had a charming beauty with its little wooden houses and cobblestone streets, but there was something strange in the air, something that I couldn't immediately identify. My new house was close to a lake which the locals called Dark Lake. Since I arrived, I noticed that the villagers avoided talking about the place, and whenever I mentioned the lake, they fell silent, exchanging nervous glances. Curiosity began to eat away at me. Something inside me needed to understand what was so scary about this seemingly harmless body of water. On my first night in the new house, I went out on the porch, watching the lake in the distance. The full moon reflected off the calm surface, Creating an almost hypnotic scene, I felt a strange attraction to that place, a feeling that mixed fascination and fear. The next day, I started talking to some locals, trying to get information about the lake. I met Dona Marta, an elderly and kind lady who sold homemade bread at the city fair. She seemed hesitant when I asked about the lake, but she ended up sharing a few stories. According to her, many have drowned in Dark Lake over the years. Some were unsuspecting tourists, others local residents who simply disappeared into the waters. You should stay away from that lake, boy, she warned me, her blue eyes fixed on mine. They say the spirits of the drowned still roam there, seeking revenge. I smiled politely, but I couldn't take his words very seriously. I was a rational man. I didn't believe in ghosts. Even so, curiosity continued to grow. I decided to explore the lake more closely. I grabbed a flashlight and ventured to the shore. Mist rose over the water, creating an almost surreal atmosphere. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the occasional sound of a frog or the rustle of leaves. There was something unsettling about the stillness of that place. As I approached, I felt a chill run down my spine. The water seemed to call to me, a soft whisper that I could barely discern. I crouched near the shore trying to see something through the fog, but the darkness seemed to devour the light of my flashlight. Suddenly, I heard a sound. It was a low sound, like a murmur coming from somewhere on the lake. The heart accelerated. I was paralyzed, trying to understand if it was my imagination playing tricks. But the sound continued, becoming clearer and clearer. It was as if someone was whispering my name. Raphael, Raphael. I jumped up, looking around. There was nobody. The feeling of being watched was almost palpable. I started walking back home, quickening my pace. When I finally got in, I locked the door and sat on the couch, trying to calm my breathing. What the hell was going on? Over the next few nights, the whispers continued. Every time I got closer to the lake, I could hear them, louder and more desperate. I began to have nightmares about ghostly figures rising from the water, their faces contorted in agony. I woke up in a cold sweat, with the feeling that something was watching me from the window. My mind was in shambles, but I needed to understand what was happening. I decided to visit the city library, looking for historical records about the lake. I spent hours leafing through old newspapers and documents. I discovered that many years ago, there was a tragic accident at the lake. 
a tourist boat capsized, and several people drowned. Since then, drownings have continued to occur, always in mysterious ways. The stories were disturbing, but there was a pattern. All drownings occurred at night, during a full moon. The next full moon was approaching, and I knew I needed to do something. I couldn't continue living in fear. On the night of the full moon, I prepared to face my fears. I took with me a camera, a recorder, and the old flashlight. I returned to the lakeshore, determined to discover the truth. The fog was thicker than ever, and the whispers began as I approached. Raphael, help us. The voice was clear, anguished. I felt a shiver run through my body, but I continued moving forward. I turned on the camera and recorder, trying to capture any evidence. I walked to the point where the whispers seemed loudest, and then something strange happened. The water began to stir, forming small waves. The flashlight shook in my hand, and I saw something emerge from the lake. It was an indistinct figure made of mist and shadows. His eyes glowed sinisterly, and his voice became a scream. Help us, Raphael. I took a step back, but I couldn't take my eyes off the figure. She seemed to get closer, floating on the water. My heart was beating out of control. My breathing was shallow. I was caught between the desire to escape and the need to understand. Who, who are you? I managed to ask, my voice shaking. We are those who were taken by the lake. We cannot rest until the truth is revealed. Before he could ask further, the figure dissolved into the mist and the lake returned to calm. I stood there, stunned, trying to process what I had just seen. The words echoed in my mind. The truth must be revealed. But what's true? I returned home, my thoughts racing. I reviewed the recordings, but the whispers were barely audible, and the figure on the camera was just a blur. But I knew what I had seen and heard. Over the next few weeks, I continued investigating, talking to more residents and digging through files. I discovered that many of those who drowned were people who had some sort of connection to the boat accident. Family, friends, even the boat captain had disappeared in the waters of the lake. The more I discovered, the deeper the mystery deepened. I began to feel like I was being followed, that the lake spirits didn't want me to stop. The tension was constant, the feeling of imminent danger always present. One night while reviewing my notes, I heard a sound coming from the window. I looked and saw a figure standing at the edge of the lake, watching me. It was the same figure as before, made of mist and shadows. I approached the window and the figure raised his hand, pointing to the lake. Help us, Raphael. Reveal the truth. That night was the longest of my life. I lay awake, trying to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Something terrible had happened in that lake. Something that needed to be revealed so that souls could rest. The next day, I decided to go back to the lake, this time during the day. Maybe the sunlight revealed something the darkness hid. I walked along the bank, observing every detail, looking for any clues. It was then that I found an old wooden sign, half buried in the earth. I brushed off the dirt and could read the faded words. Careful, dangerous waters. Keep away at night. The pieces started to fall into place. The lake was a dangerous place, but why didn't the authorities do anything? I decided to confront the city's mayor, a man named Augusto. I went to his office and knocked on the door with determination. I need to talk to you about Dark Lake, he said as he opened the door. Augusto looked at me suspiciously but invited me in. I explained everything I had discovered, the voices, the figures, the mysterious deaths. He listened silently but his eyes showed a mixture of fear and guilt. There's something you're not telling me, I insisted. He sighed and got up going to a shelf and picking up an old book. He opened to a bookmarked page and showed me an old article, dated many years ago. The article talked about the boat accident, but it mentioned something I didn't know. The boat sank because of human error, said Augusto, his voice low. The captain was drunk and there was a fight on board. Authorities covered up the truth to protect the city's reputation. His words hit me like a punch. The captain, an irresponsible man had caused the deaths of many people, and the entire city had covered it up. The spirits could not rest, 
until the truth was revealed. I need to tell everyone, he said decisively. People need to know the truth. Augusto reluctantly agreed, and together, we organized a meeting with the city's residents. That night, I revealed everything I had discovered. Reactions were mixed. Shock, anger, sadness. But finally, the truth was out. That night I went back to the lake one last time. The fog was thicker than ever, but I felt a strange peace. The voices were no longer whispering and the mist figure did not appear. The spirits were at peace finally. As I watched the lake, a sense of relief washed over me. I knew my life would never be the same, but at least now, those who had been taken by the lake could rest in peace Elderville went on with their lives. But something had changed. People still avoided the lake, but no longer out of fear of the spirits. Now it was out of respect. And I, well, I knew I could never really leave that place. The truth had been revealed, but the shadows of the past would always accompany me. The peace I felt leaving the lake that night was temporary. Over the next few weeks, things began to change in Elderville. The gloomy atmosphere persisted and I realized that the lake still exerted a sinister influence over the city. People continued to disappear and the whispers returned, now more intense and desperate. Something still wasn't right and I needed to find out what it was. My curiosity and need for answers led me back to the library where I spent hours immersed in old books and records. I found references to local rituals and legends that spoke of an ancient pact sealed between the city's founders and an aquatic entity. The records were fragmentary and confusing, but they pointed to something much more sinister than a simple boating accident. One night, while reviewing my notes at home, I heard a strange sound coming from the back door. It was a soft scratching as if something or someone was trying to get in. My heart raced and I grabbed a knife from the kitchen before approaching. I opened the door slowly, but there was no one there just the darkness of the backyard and the sound of the wind passing through the trees. I closed the door, but the scratching continued. This time, coming from the living room window, my nerves were frayed, and every little noise seemed to amplify my fear. I took a deep breath and walked to the window. When I looked outside, I saw a shadowy figure standing at the edge of the lake. The figure watched me fixedly, without moving a muscle. Cold ran down my spine and I felt as if something was pulling me outward. Toward that ominous presence, I decided to confront the figure. I grabbed my flashlight and headed out, crossing the lawn with hesitant steps. With each step, the fear increased, but something inside me compelled me to continue. By the time I reached the lakeshore, the figure had disappeared, but the whispers were back, louder and clearer than ever. Raphael, need to know the truth, need to stop the cycle. The whispers were almost deafening and the feeling of being watched was overwhelming. I fell to my knees trying to understand what was happening. It was then that I saw, reflected in the water, the ghostly figure I had seen before. But this time she wasn't alone. Several other figures began to emerge from the depths of the lake, all with expressions of despair and agony. The figures came closer, surrounding me, and one of them spoke, his voice a painful echo. The truth has not been completely revealed. There is more, a lot more. The pact needs to be broken. Before he could ask further, the figures disappeared and the water became calm again. I got up, shaking, and walked home, trying to process what I had just witnessed, the pact. I needed to understand what it meant and how I could break it. The next day, I looked for Dona Marta again. I told her about my encounters and the figures in the lake. Her eyes widened and she led me to her basement, where she kept an old box full of documents and journals among them was a diary from one of the city's founders, which talked about the pact. The pact was made to protect the city, but it came at a terrible cost, explained Dona Marta. The aquatic entity demanded sacrifices. The founders agreed to exchange lives for the city's success and prosperity. The pieces finally fell into place. The pact was the reason for the drownings and hauntings. I needed to find a way to break it, but the diary offered no clear answers. 
It only mentioned a final ritual that should be performed on the night of the full moon, with a specific object, a medallion that had been lost for decades. Determined to find the medallion, I searched every corner of the city, asking older residents about its whereabouts. The search led me to an abandoned house on the outskirts of town, where the medallion's last holder had reportedly lived. I entered the house, the wood creaking beneath my feet, and the darkness seemed to drown out any light. After hours of searching, I found a wooden box hidden under the floor. Inside, wrapped in an ancient fabric, was the medallion. As I touched it, I felt a jolt of energy course through my body, and the whispers began again. But this time they were different. They were voices of warning, of despair. Raphael, time is running out. With the medallion in hand, I returned to the lake on the night of the full moon. The fog was almost impenetrable, and the whispers were deafening. I followed the diary's instructions, reciting the ancient words of the ritual. Figures began to emerge from the lake surrounding me, but this time they were not threatening. They seemed to beg for release. At the culminating moment of the ritual, I threw the medallion into the lake, and an intense light exploded from the water, illuminating the night. The figures began to disappear, and the whispers finally stopped. I felt a deep peace, knowing that the spirits were free. But as I walked away from the lake, a sense of restlessness remained. Something still wasn't right. The pact had been broken, but the lake's dark influence persisted. I knew this wasn't the end. There were more secrets hidden in the dark waters of Elderville, and I was determined to uncover the full truth no matter the cost. The opening for the sequel was clear. The city still had its mysteries, and the lake still hid horrors beyond comprehension. And I, Raphael, knew that my journey was far from over. The days following the ritual were strange. Although the whispers had ceased, an unsettling feeling still hovered over Elderville. The night seemed darker, and the lake, although silent, seemed to have an even more sinister presence. I knew it wasn't over. Something was still hidden in the depths of that damn lake I decided to explore deeper, literally. I knew I had to go down into the waters of the lake to find out what was down there. Equipped with a wetsuit and a high-powered flashlight, I prepared for the descent. The idea of diving into that lake terrified me, but I knew it was necessary. The next night, when the moon was partially covered by clouds, I went to the lake shore. The waters were calm, reflecting the little moonlight. The fog, which seemed to be a constant there, hovered over the surface like a spectral veil. I took a deep breath and entered the water, feeling the icy cold penetrate my wetsuit. The descent was slow and claustrophobic. Darkness enveloped me, and the flashlight could barely penetrate the density of the water. With every meter I descended, I felt increasing pressure, not just physical, but as if the lake itself was trying to repel me. After a few minutes, I saw something at the bottom. It was an old boat, covered in algae and partially buried in mud. The accident boat, I thought. My heart raced as I approached. The stories of Dona Marta and the Founder's Diary echoed in my mind. I needed to find evidence that this place held more secrets. While exploring the wreckage, I found personal items, torn clothes, and scattered bones. But what really caught my attention was a metal trunk stuck underneath part of the boat. With a lot of effort, I managed to free it, and upon opening it, I found old documents. Probably belonging to the captain among them were a map and a diary. I surfaced with the trunk and quickly swam back to shore. Upon opening the captain's journal, I discovered the true extent of the pact. He had made a deal with an ancient entity to grant him wealth and prosperity. But in return, he had to sacrifice lives to the lake. The diary was full of gruesome details about the rituals and sacrifices performed. As I read, I felt a presence around me. I looked at the lake and saw several figures emerging from the water, all watching me silently. Fear took over me, but I continued reading. The map showed a specific location at the bottom of the lake, marked as the origin. Something told me that that place held the key to completely breaking the curse. 
I decided I needed to go down again, this time to Inception. I knew it would be dangerous, but I had no choice. The city depended on it. With the map in hand, I prepared for the final descent. Before entering the water, however, I felt a cold hand touch my shoulder. I turned sharply and saw the figure of a woman, pale and translucent. You must end this, Raphael, she said, her voice a whisper. We are trapped here because of the pact. Free us. I nodded, determined. I entered the water again, following the directions on the map. The descent was even more oppressive this time. The darkness seemed thicker and the pressure stronger. But I continued, guided by the need to end that nightmare. Finally, I got to Inception. It was an underwater cave, hidden deep within the lake. The entrance was covered in algae and rocks, but I managed to fight my way through. Inside, I found an ancient altar with strange inscriptions on the walls. In the center, there was a black crystal pulsing with an evil energy. As I approached, I felt a force trying to repel me, but I knew what I needed to do. I took the crystal and with all my strength, I smashed it against the altar. An explosion of light and energy enveloped me and I felt like I was being pulled out of the lake. When I regained consciousness, I was on the bank, panting. The lake was calm and the figures had disappeared. I felt a deep peace, knowing that the pact had finally been broken. The souls were free, but something still bothered me. The captain's diary mentioned one last thing, a guardian who protected the pact. Someone or something that wouldn't rest until the city was destroyed. I knew my journey wasn't over yet. I returned home feeling a mixture of relief and worry. The peace in Elderville was fragile and true terror still lurked. He was determined to find the guardian and end the curse once and for all. Looking at the lake from my window, I knew that the darkness had not yet completely lifted. The real challenge was just beginning. And I, Raphael, was ready to face anything that came my way. The story of Elderville and its dark lake was far from over, and I was at the center of it, ready to uncover all the secrets and finally bring peace to that cursed town. The weeks following my return from the depths of the lake were tense. The city seemed calmer, but there was a sense of something dark and imminent in the air. The captain's journal and his mentions of the Covenant Keeper haunted my thoughts and I knew I needed to be prepared for the worst. One night, while I was reviewing my notes in the living room, the temperature in the house dropped drastically. A biting, unearthly cold took over the room and I heard a deep sound, like a distant roar, coming from the lake. I jumped up, grabbing the flashlight and quickly leaving. The moon was covered by dark clouds and the fog was thicker than ever. I ran to the edge of the lake, where the water was restless, forming whirlpools. The ghostly figures began to emerge again, but this time, they were not souls seeking help. They were distorted shadows, their eyes glowing with a menacing red light. In the center of the lake, a colossal figure began to rise from the depths. The Guardian. The Guardian was a grotesque creature, a mix of human and beast with dark scales covering its body. His eyes were pits of darkness, and a deafening roar echoed as he rose to his full height, shaking the earth. He started moving towards me, each step making the ground shake. Fear took over me, but I knew I couldn't run away. He needed to face the creature and end the curse once and for all. I remembered the inscriptions on the altar in the underwater cave and the words in the captain's diary. The guardian could be defeated, but it would require a sacrifice. I picked up the medallion I had retrieved, feeling the energy pulse in my hands. With renewed courage, I advanced towards the lake, the whispers of souls guiding me. The guardian roared again and I felt the ground shake beneath my feet. I reached the shore and held up the medallion, reciting the ancient words I had memorized. An intense light emanated from the medallion, illuminating the night. The guardian hesitated, his eyes fixed on the light. I felt an invisible force pulling me toward the water, but I continued reciting the words, my voice rising over the creature's roar. The medallion's light intensified and the guardian let out a scream of agony. The land around the lake began to open up and a bluish light emerged from the depths. The ghostly figures began to be drawn into the light, 
their distorted forms disappearing one by one. The Guardian struggled against the force of light, but it was clear he was losing. With one last effort, I threw the medallion toward the creature. The impact was immediate. The Guardian let out a final roar and began to disintegrate, its scales shattering and being sucked into the light. The earth shook violently and the bluish light expanded, engulfing everything around it. I felt a strong pull and lost consciousness. When I came to, I was lying on the shore of the lake. The fog had disappeared and the night was incredibly calm. The lake, now serene, reflected starlight. The figures were gone, and the Guardian was no longer there. I felt a deep peace, as if a great weight had finally been lifted. I stood up slowly, feeling every muscle sore. I looked around and saw the residents of Elderville starting to emerge from their homes, attracted by the unusual silence. Their expressions were of relief and gratitude. They knew something terrible had been defeated. The city was finally free from the lake's curse. Restless souls could rest, and residents could go about their lives without fear. As I walked back to my house, I knew my journey had come to an end. The story of Elderville and its shadowy lake was finally over. But even as he felt peace return, he knew the world was full of dark places and ancient secrets. My experience in Elderville taught me that evil can hide in the most unexpected places. Although this battle had been won, others could arise and I, Raphael, was ready to face any darkness that came, bringing light and peace wherever it was needed. The story was over, but my search for truth and justice was just beginning. On the outskirts of the small village of Villanova, there was a farm known for being haunted by the vengeful spirits of the former residents. For decades, the property had been avoided by everyone, the dilapidated buildings and overgrown fields a constant reminder of the tragedies that had occurred there. When a young woman, determined to start her life over, decided to buy the farm to turn it into an inn, she didn't know she was about to be plunged into a supernatural nightmare. My name is Clara. And since I decided to start my life over after a failed relationship, I felt an inexplicable attraction to the old farm in Villanova. When I saw it for the first time, abandoned and decaying, I felt a mixture of fascination and sadness. Maybe it was the promise of renewal that I saw in that place that made me decide to buy it. I planned to transform the old farm into a welcoming inn, a refuge for those, like me, looking for a new beginning. However, within the first few days, I realized that there was something strange about the farm. The structures were in ruins, with peeling walls and broken windows. The silence was oppressive, broken only by the rustle of wind passing through the trees. I started working on the renovations, hiring some locals to help me. But soon, they began talking about the former residents and the spirits that, they said, still roamed the property. You should stay away from that place, girl said Donna Rita, an elderly woman from the village, as she bought some groceries at the local store. The former residents do not rest in peace. The farm is cursed. I smiled politely, but I didn't take his warning seriously. I'm a rational woman and I didn't believe in ghosts. However, over the next few nights, I started to notice strange things. The wind seemed to carry whispers and shadows danced in the broken windows. I felt a constant presence as if I were being watched. One night, while working alone in the kitchen of the main house, I heard a loud sound coming from upstairs. It sounded like the dragging of heavy furniture. I grabbed a flashlight and went up the stairs, feeling my heart race with each step. As I reached the hallway, I saw that the door to the owner's old bedroom was ajar, and a dim light was flickering inside. I cautiously pushed the door open, and the flashlight illuminated the dusty room. The walls were covered in burn marks and the air was freezing. In the center of the room, there was a rocking chair that moved on its own, creaking with a sound that made me shiver. Who's there? I asked, voice shaking. The creaking stopped and silence took over the room. 
Approaching the chair, I noticed that there was an old diary on the table next to it. I picked it up and started reading. It belonged to the former owner, Amelia. Its pages were filled with disturbing accounts of life on the farm, mentioning strange rituals and inexplicable events. Amelia was writing about an evil presence on the farm. I muttered to myself, feeling a chill. I kept reading, and the details became more and more disturbing. She described how her husband, Henrique, began to change, becoming violent and paranoid. He mentioned voices he heard and visions that tormented him. As I read, I felt a cold breeze pass by me, and the bedroom door closed with a bang. The flashlight flickered and went out, plunging the room into darkness. Panic took over me, and I heard whispers around me. Clear. Skirt. Now. The voices were harrowing, as if thousands of souls were speaking at once. With my heart beating wildly, I groped in the darkness until I found the door and left the room. I ran up the stairs and out of the house, breathing in the cold night air. I needed to understand what was happening. I decided to look for more information in the village, hoping to discover the truth about the farm. The next day I went to the local library, where I met Mr. Alvaro, the librarian. I told him about my experiences and showed Amelia's diary. He looked at me seriously. The history of this farm is ancient and tragic, he said, leading me to a section of old files. Many believe that the spirits of the former residents still haunt the place. We spent hours reading old records and newspaper articles I discovered that Enrique, Amelia's husband, had gone crazy and killed his entire family before hanging himself in the barn. Residents believed he was possessed by an evil force that inhabited the farm. The records mentioned ancient rituals and sacrifices performed to appease the spirits. I returned to the farm with a growing sense of dread. The words of Dona Rita and Mr. Alvaro echoed in my mind. I began to notice more supernatural activities. Doors closed by themselves, I heard footsteps upstairs when I was alone, and shadows passed in the corners of my eyes. The nights were the worst. I felt a constant presence in my room, as if someone was watching me while I slept. I decided I needed to face evil head on. I prepared myself for the night, with Amelia's diary and some candles. I lit the candles in the living room and began reading the diary accounts aloud. Amelia's words were distressing, but I knew she needed to continue. When I finished reading, I felt my temperature drop drastically. The candles flickered and went out, and an oppressive darkness took over the room. Suddenly, I heard the sound of heavy footsteps coming from upstairs. Dread took over me, but I knew I couldn't back down. I grabbed the flashlight and climbed the stairs, each step a challenge. When I reached the hallway, I saw a dark figure at the end, standing in front of the door to the owner's room. Who are you? I asked, trying to hide the fear in my voice. The figure didn't respond, just slowly turned around, revealing a pale, deformed face. His eyes were black holes and a guttural voice came out of his mouth. You don't belong here. Leave now, before it's too late. I swallowed hard, trying to maintain my composure. I will not leave. I want to help spirits find peace. The figure laughed, a cold, cruel sound. Peace. There is no peace for those who have been claimed by darkness. Before he could respond, the figure disappeared, and the bedroom door opened with a bang. I entered the room, feeling an intense presence around me. The rocking chair was moving again, and the feeling of being watched was unbearable. Show yourself, I screamed my voice full of despair. Suddenly the bedroom window opened and a strong wind came in, scattering papers and objects throughout the room. A dark shadow emerged from the wall, taking the shape of Henry. His eyes glowed with an evil light and he advanced towards me. You shouldn't have come here, Clara. Now he will suffer the same fate. I felt an invisible force pull me back and I fell to the ground. Henry approached his presence overwhelming. I'll end this, he said, taking Amelia's diary and reciting the words she had written about the banishing ritual Henry's shadow hesitated, as if the words affected him. I continued reciting, my voice gaining strength. The shadow retreated, letting out a scream of agony. You can't defeat me. This is my house. 
No, it's not, I replied standing up. This house belongs to the living, and you need to leave. With one last effort, I recited the final words of the ritual. Henry's shadow let out a deafening scream and began to dissipate. The rocking chair stopped, and the temperature in the room began to return to normal. I knew I had succeeded. Henry's spirit was banished, and the farm was free of his evil presence. But as I walked down the stairs, a feeling of uneasiness remained. The farm was still permeated with pain and suffering. More needed to be done to ensure that the spirits of former residents found peace. I decided that I would restore the farm in his memory, transforming it into a place of light and renewal. I began working tirelessly, cleaning up the debris and restoring the buildings. Every wall painted, every window repaired was a step towards driving away the darkness. The residents of Villanova began to support me, seeing my determination to transform the farm into a safe haven. During this time, I continued to feel presences, but they seemed less threatening. It was as if the spirits were watching, waiting to see if I could truly bring peace to the place they suffered so much. Finally, after months of hard work, the farm was ready to open as a bed and breakfast. I organized an opening ceremony, inviting everyone in the village to participate. On opening night, as guests gathered in the main room, I felt a familiar presence. I looked towards the corner of the room and saw Amelia's figure, smiling serenely. She looked peaceful, and a comforting warmth filled my heart. I knew I had finally made it. Villanova's farm, once haunted by the horrors of the past, was now a place of light and renewal. The spirits found peace, and I found a new purpose. But even as he celebrated, he knew that the fight against the darkness was never truly over. I would remain vigilant, ready to protect my new home from any threat that might arise. And so, the story of the Villanova haunted farm continued, but now, it was a story of hope and renewal. The farm, once marked by terror, was now a symbol of courage and determination. And I, Clara, was ready to face any challenge that the future brought, always with the spirit of renewal and the strength of those who came before me. The weeks following the inn's inauguration brought new life to Fazenda de Villanova. Guests arrived, attracted by the stories of renovation and the peaceful beauty of the place. The hard work was starting to pay off, and the farm flourished as a refuge for those seeking peace and rest. However, the feeling of restlessness never completely left me. There were nights when I woke up in a cold sweat feeling the presence of something dark, something that shouldn't be there. One of these nights was particularly disturbing. The inn was full, and the guests slept peacefully, but I could not find rest. I got up and walked to the porch, trying to clear my mind. The air was cold and a thick fog covered the fields around the farm. As I stared into the darkness, I heard a faint, almost imperceptible whisper. It was a sound I already knew well, a sound that made me shiver. Clear. Help us. The voice was harrowing, as if thousands of souls were speaking at once. I felt a chill run through my body and I grabbed the flashlight, deciding to investigate. I followed the sound to the barn where the door was ajar. The air inside was thick and the flashlight could barely illuminate the dark space. As I entered, I heard soft footsteps behind me, and I quickly turned around. But there was no one. The feeling of being watched was overwhelming. As I walked through the barn, I noticed something strange on the floor. It was an ancient symbol drawn with a dark substance, perhaps dried blood. The symbol radiated an evil energy, and as I approached, the flashlight flickered and went out. The darkness was total, and the whispers intensified, echoing off the barn walls. Clear, you need to free us. The voice was clearer now, and I felt a presence approaching. I tried turning on the flashlight again, but to no avail. Panic began to take over me, and I felt a cold touch on my shoulder. I turned around, my heart racing, but there was no one. The symbol on the ground began to glow with an ominous light, and I saw spectral figures emerge from the shadows. Who are you? I asked, trying to remain calm. One of the figures, a woman with a pale face and sad eyes, approached. 
We are the spirits of those who were sacrificed here. We were arrested by Henrique and his rituals. You have partially freed us, but we are still tied to this place. What do I need to do to free them completely? I asked, feeling a knot form in my stomach. The woman pointed to the symbol on the floor. This is the symbol of the pact. You need to destroy it and perform the liberation ritual. Only then can our souls rest. I took a deep breath, trying to process what she said. How do I do this? She handed me a small book with yellowed pages full of symbols and instructions. Follow instructions and be careful. The evil that Henry invoked is still present. It will not be easy. I picked up the book, feeling its weight. I will do whatever is necessary. The figures began to disappear and the lantern came on again. Illuminating the barn with a dim light, I knew I needed to act quickly. I went back to the main house and started reading the book. The instructions were clear, but the ritual required courage and determination. He needed to perform the ritual in the heart of the farm, where Henrique had made his sacrifices. The next night, I prepared everything for the ritual. I summoned the bravest villagers, explaining what needed to be done. They agreed to help, knowing it was the only way to bring peace to the farm. We set up the altar in the barn, with candles and protective amulets around the symbol. When everything was ready, I started reciting the words from the book. The temperature dropped drastically and a feeling of dread came over us. The candles flickered and the shadows began to move forming indistinct figures. I continued reciting, my voice gaining strength. The symbol on the ground began to glow brightly and I felt a dark presence approaching. Suddenly a dark figure emerged from the symbol. It was Henry, or what was left of him. His eyes glowed with an evil light, and he advanced towards us. You can't stop me. This is my domain. His voice echoed with supernatural strength. No, Henry. This is the end for you, I replied, continuing to recite the words of the ritual. The spectral figures of the sacrifices began to appear, forming a circle around Henry. They recited along with me, their voices joining mine. The light from the symbol became more intense, and Henrique let out a scream of agony. No, this cannot be happening. His form began to disintegrate, and I felt a wave of energy pass through me. With one last effort, I recited the final words of the ritual. Enrique let out a deafening scream and disappeared in a cloud of shadows. The symbol's light went out and the barn fell silent. The spectral figures began to disappear one by one, leaving behind a sense of peace. The villagers and I sat in silence for a moment, absorbing what had just happened. We knew we had done it. The farm was finally free from the evil that haunted it. As I looked at the faded symbol on the ground, I felt a new determination rise within me. Villanova Farm, once haunted by the horrors of the past, was now a place of light and renewal. The spirits were free, and I knew I had accomplished my mission. But even with peace restored, he knew he needed to remain vigilant. Darkness may always return, and I will be ready to face it. As we walked back to the main house, I looked at the farm with a new sense of purpose. The story of the Villanova haunted farm continued, but now it was a story of courage, determination, and hope. And I, Clara, was ready for any challenge that the future brought, always with the strength of those who came before me. The night was calm, but I knew the work would never be completely finished. Villanova farm was now a symbol of renewal, but also a reminder that the fight against darkness is eternal. I will always be prepared to protect this place, to ensure that the light always prevails over the shadows. The days that followed the ritual brought renewed peace to Villanova Farm. Guests continued to arrive and the inn prospered. But even with the apparent tranquility, a persistent feeling of restlessness remained. The nights were silent, but that silence had a weight as if the farm still held dark secrets. One night, while searching the basement for old materials to restore, I found a door hidden behind a wooden panel. The door was small and looked like it had been locked for decades. I took an old key that I found in Henrique's things and to my surprise, it fit perfectly into the lock. 
the door opened with a low creak, revealing a staircase leading down to an underground chamber. I descended cautiously, the flashlight illuminating the narrow, damp path. The air was heavy and smelled musty. When I reached the bottom, I saw a large room with walls covered in ancient symbols and writings. In the center of the room, there was a stone pedestal with an ancient book on it, surrounded by unlit candles and human bones. The scenery was disturbing, and a feeling of dread came over me. I picked up the book, feeling its weight and dark energy. The pages were filled with text in a language I didn't recognize, but the images were clear enough to understand. They described rituals of invocation and sacrifice, similar to those that Henry had performed. But there was something more, something about a portal that could be opened, linking our reality to a dimension of pure terror. As I looked through the book, I felt an icy cold around me. The flashlight flickered and went out, plunging the chamber into darkness. I felt a presence approaching and heard familiar whispers, but now more threatening. Clear, you shouldn't be here. The voice was deep and resonated with supernatural strength. I tried to turn on the flashlight again, but my hands were shaking. When I finally did, I saw a hooded figure standing at the entrance to the chamber. His face was hidden in shadows, but his eyes shone with an ominous light. You freed some, but not all. Evil still resides here, the figure said, the voice echoing through the room. And you, Clara, opened a door that should never have been opened. Dread took over me, but I knew I needed to act. Who are you? What do you want? The figure laughed a sound that made my skin crawl. I am the keeper of secrets. And now, you are part of them. Before I could react, the figure advanced, and I felt an invisible force pin me against the wall. The flashlight fell from my hands and the book opened by itself, its pages turning quickly. The chamber began to shake and a dark portal opened on the floor, emitting an evil purple light. You will be the next sacrifice, the figure whispered approaching. The portal needs a soul to remain closed. I fought against the force that held me, trying to free myself. The whispers around me intensified, and spectral figures began to emerge from the portal, extending spectral hands towards me. No, I won't allow it, I screamed forcing my body to move. With a supreme effort, I managed to pick up the book and began to recite the words that were written. The figure hesitated, and the force holding me weakened. I continued reciting, my voice gaining strength with each word. The portal began to close, and the spectral figures let out screams of agony. You cannot do that! You can't defeat me! The figure shouted, charging forward with fury. But I didn't stop. I continued reciting until the last word. The portal closed with a bang, and the figure let out a deafening scream before disappearing in a cloud of shadows. The chamber fell silent, and the feeling of dread began to subside. I took a deep breath, trying to catch my breath. I knew I had succeeded, but the cost was high. The farm was safe for now, but the evil that lived there was not yet completely defeated. I needed to understand more about the book and the rituals to ensure that the portal remained closed and the spirits found peace. I returned to the main house, still shaking from what had happened. I sat in the living room, the old book in my hands. I knew that the fight against darkness was far from over. The farm still held dark secrets and I needed to be ready to face them. Over the next few weeks, I continued to study the book learning more about the rituals and sacrifices that had been performed there. I discovered that the portal could be permanently sealed, but it would require a complex and dangerous ritual. I summoned the villagers again, explaining the situation. We knew we needed to act quickly before the evil returned with greater force. We prepared for the final ritual, gathering the necessary items and setting up the altar in the barn. On the appointed night, we light the candles and begin to recite the words from the book. The temperature dropped drastically, and the feeling of dread returned. Shadows began to move, and spectral figures appeared around us. Don't stop! Keep reciting! I shouted, trying to stay calm. The words of the ritual echoed through the barn, and the portal began to open again. 
But this time, we were prepared. We formed a circle around the altar, raising our protective amulets. The candlelight intensified, and the spectral figures let out screams of agony. The hooded figure appeared again, his eyes glowing with an evil fury. You can't stop me. The portal needs to be powered. Not this time, I replied, my voice firm. We will seal him forever. With one last effort, we recite the final words of the ritual. The portal began to close and the hooded figure let out a deafening scream before disappearing in an explosion of shadows. The chamber fell silent and the feeling of dread began to fade. We knew we had done it. The farm was finally free from the evil that haunted it. The spirits of the former residents found peace and Villanova's farm flourished as a safe haven. But even with peace restored, we knew that the fight against the darkness was never completely over. We would remain vigilant, ready to face any threat that might arise. As I looked at the farm, I felt a new determination rise within me. The story of the Villanova haunted farm continued, but now it was a story of hope, courage and renewal. And I, Clara, was ready for any challenge that the future brought, always with the strength of those who came before me. The night was calm, but I knew the work would never be completely finished. Villanova Farm was now a symbol of renewal, but also a reminder that the fight against darkness is eternal. I will always be prepared to protect this place, to ensure that the light always prevails over the shadows. And so, the story of Villanova Farm continued, always with a new threat lurking, but also with the certainty that courage and determination would always triumph. The weeks that followed the ritual brought an uneasy peace to Villanova Farm. Guests continued to arrive, enchanted by the serenity and beauty of the place. However, the feeling of restlessness never completely left me. The nights were silent, but the silence was thick, as if the farm still hid dark secrets. One night, as I made one last round of the property before bed, I noticed a faint light emanating from the barn. My heart quickened and, grabbing a flashlight and my knife, I walked toward the source of the light. The air was cold and heavy, and each step felt more difficult than the last. When I reached the barn, the door was ajar, and the dim light danced in the darkness inside. I pushed the door carefully and entered. The barn was empty except for the stone pedestal he had found earlier. The dim light came from the symbol on the floor, which was now glowing with increasing intensity. I heard a rustling sound and quickly turned around. To my horror, I saw the hooded figure standing in the corner, watching me with eyes that glowed like embers. You shouldn't be here, the figure said, the throaty voice echoing through the barn. You opened a door that should never have been opened. I felt a chill run down my spine. Who are you? What do you want? I asked, trying to hide the fear in my voice. I am the keeper of secrets, he replied, advancing slowly and now you are part of them. Before I could react, the figure raised a hand and I felt an invisible force push me back, pinning me against the wall. The flashlight fell from my hand, rolling out of my reach. The symbol on the ground began to glow even more brightly and I felt an evil energy fill the air. I fought against the force that held me trying to free myself. You can't stop me, I shouted, trying to stay calm. I'll end this. The figure laughed, a cold, cruel sound. Do you think you can stop me? The evil that resides here is older and more powerful than you can imagine. Suddenly, the symbol on the ground began to expand, forming a circle of purple light. The ground shook, and a portal began to open, emitting an ominous light. Spectral figures began to emerge from the portal, extending spectral hands toward me. You will be the next sacrifice, the figure whispered, approaching. The portal needs a soul to remain closed. Dread took over me, but I knew I needed to act. With a supreme effort, I managed to pick up the book that was on the pedestal and began to recite the words that were written. The figure hesitated, and the force holding me weakened. I continued reciting, my voice gaining strength. 
The portal began to close and the spectral figures let out screams of agony. No, this cannot be happening. The figure shouted, charging forward with fury. But I didn't stop. I continued reciting until the last word. The portal closed with a bang and the figure let out a deafening scream before disappearing in a cloud of shadows. The barn fell silent and the feeling of dread began to subside. I took a deep breath, trying to catch my breath. I knew I had succeeded, but the cost was high. The farm was safe for now, but the evil that lived there was not yet completely defeated. I needed to understand more about the book and the rituals to ensure that the portal remained closed and the spirits found peace. I returned to the main house, still shaking from what had happened. I sat in the living room, the old book in my hands. I knew that the fight against darkness was far from over. The farm still held dark secrets and I needed to be ready to face them. Over the next few weeks, I continued to study the book, learning more about the rituals and sacrifices that had been performed there. I discovered that the portal could be permanently sealed, but it would require a complex and dangerous ritual I summoned the villagers again, explaining the situation. We knew we needed to act quickly, before the evil returned with greater force. We prepared for the final ritual, gathering the necessary items and setting up the altar in the barn. On the appointed night, we light the candles and begin to recite the words from the book. The temperature dropped drastically, and the feeling of dread returned. Shadows began to move and spectral figures appeared around us. Don't stop, keep reciting, I shouted, trying to stay calm. The words of the ritual echoed through the barn and the portal began to open again. But this time we were prepared. We formed a circle around the altar, raising our protective amulets. The candlelight intensified and the spectral figures let out screams of agony. The hooded figure appeared again, his eyes glowing with an evil fury. You can't stop me. The portal needs to be powered. Not this time, I replied, my voice firm. We will seal him forever. With one last effort, we recite the final words of the ritual. The portal began to close and the hooded figure let out a deafening scream before disappearing in an explosion of shadows. The chamber fell silent and the feeling of dread began to fade. We knew we had made it. The farm was finally free from the evil that haunted it. The spirits of the former residents found peace and Villanova's farm flourished as a safe haven but even with peace restored, we knew that the fight against the darkness was never completely over. We would remain vigilant, ready to face any threat that might arise. As I looked at the farm, I felt a new determination rise within me. The story of the Villanova haunted farm continued, but now it was a story of hope, courage, and renewal. And I, Clara, was ready for any challenge that the future brought always with the strength of those who came before me. The night was calm, but I knew the work would never be completely finished. Villanova Farm was now a symbol of renewal, but also a reminder that the fight against darkness is eternal. I will always be prepared to protect this place, to ensure that the light always prevails over the shadows. And so, the story of Villanova Farm continued, always with a new threat lurking but also with the certainty that courage and determination would always triumph. Part of the small village of Montenegro surrounded by dense forest, the inhabitants lived in constant fear. The Wailing Forest, as it was called, was known for its mysterious disappearances and macabre whispers that could be heard at dusk. Over the years, many people entered the forest and were never seen again. Among them was João, Mateus's younger brother, who disappeared a year ago. Determined to find out what happened, Mateus decides to face his fears and enter the forest in search of the truth and his lost brother. My name is Mateus, and since the disappearance of my brother João, my life has turned into a constant nightmare. With each passing day, the guilt and despair increased. 
Juwan was my younger brother, and I was supposed to protect him. But on that fateful night, he entered the Wailing Forest and never returned. I needed to find him. I needed to know what happened. The village of Montenegro was small, and everyone knew everyone. People looked at me with pity, but also with fear. No one wanted to talk about the forest or Juan. Stories of mysterious disappearances and dark creatures that inhabited the forest had been told for generations, but no one seemed to have the courage to investigate. The night I decided to enter the forest, the moon was full, partially lighting the path. I grabbed a flashlight, a knife, and some provisions. I felt a chill running down my spine, but my determination to find my brother overcame my fear. As I approached the edge of the forest, I could feel the eyes of the villagers watching me, but no one dared to stop me. The entrance to the forest was dark and oppressive. The tall, gnarled trees formed a roof of branches that blocked the moonlight. The darkness felt alive, as if it enveloped me and whispered ancient, dangerous secrets. With each step I took, the silence became denser, broken only by the sound of my own steps and the rapid beating of my heart. As he advanced, the flashlight illuminated shadows that seemed to dance among the trees. The feeling of being watched was almost palpable. The forest seemed to have a life of its own with strange sounds and whispers that grew louder with each step. It felt like the forest itself was trying to repel me, telling me to go back. I remembered Juan, his smile, his insatiable curiosity. It was this curiosity that led him to enter the forest that night. He wanted to explore, discover what was beyond what we knew. And now, I was here, following in his footsteps, trying to understand what attracted him and what drove him away. As I moved forward, I began to notice that the path seemed to constantly change. The trees formed mazes, and I felt lost even though I tried to follow a straight line. The forest seemed to play with me, change shape, confuse me. I took a deep breath and continued, trying to remain calm. Suddenly I heard a sound. It was a low, almost imperceptible cry. I followed the sound, my steps becoming faster and faster until I reached a clearing. In the center, there was a small hut, old and covered in moss. The crying came from inside. I approached cautiously, the knife in one hand and the flashlight in the other. I pushed the door, which creaked as it opened. Inside the cabin, the darkness was total. The flashlight revealed a figure huddled in the corner, crying softly. John, I called, voice shaking. The figure moved, slowly raising its head. When the light illuminated his face, I saw that it wasn't Juan. It was a woman with eyes red from crying and an expression of pure terror. You. You need to get out of here, she whispered, her voice full of fear. They are coming. Who's coming? I asked, but before I could get an answer, a loud, guttural sound echoed through the forest. The ground shook and I felt a wave of dread pass through me. The woman quickly got up and ran out of the cabin, disappearing into the darkness. Without thinking twice, I ran after her, the guttural sound continued getting louder, closer. The forest seemed to close in around me, branches scratching my skin, shadows moving eerily. I ran as fast as I could, but it felt like the forest was alive, trying to capture me. Finally, I reached another clearing where I stopped to catch my breath. I looked around, trying to understand where I was. It was then that I saw it. In the center of the clearing was a circle of ancient stones, covered in symbols I didn't recognize. In the middle of the circle, a tall, skeletal figure with glowing eyes and a macabre smile watched me. Matthew, the figure said, his voice like the whisper of the wind. You came in search of the truth. I trembled, but I didn't back down. Who are you? What happened to my brother? The figure laughed, a sound that made my skin crawl. I am the guardian of the forest, his brother. He made a choice just like you are doing now. Choice? What choice? I asked, my voice cracking. The power of the forest requires sacrifices. Those who enter here must face their worst fears and decide, become part of the forest or succumb to it. I felt a chill. And John? Is he alive? The guardian laughed again. 
He's here somewhere, just like the others. You need to find it if you can. But remember, the forest is not forgiving. She takes what she wants. Dread overwhelmed me, but I knew I couldn't give up. I'm going to find Joao, and I'm going to put an end to this. The figure disappeared in a whirlwind of shadows, leaving me alone in the clearing. Silence returned, but the feeling of imminent danger remained. I looked at the circle of stones and felt that I needed to continue. I took the flashlight and started walking, following instinct. The forest seemed to change again, the paths becoming more confusing. With each step, I felt the invisible eyes watching me, the shadows moving around me. The darkness was oppressive and the whispers were back, louder, more distressing. Mateus, help us. The voices whimpered. Free us. Finally, I came to a stream. The water ran calmly, but there was something strange. I looked closer and saw that the water was red as if it was mixed with blood. My stomach turned, but I continued. I followed the course of the stream until I reached a large cave, hidden by dense vegetation. The cave entrance was gloomy, and the darkness seemed to extend infinitely. But I knew I needed to go in. I took a deep breath and took the first step inside. The air was heavy, smelling of mold and death. The lantern illuminated the path, but the light seemed to be swallowed by the darkness. Inside the cave, the whispers were louder, almost deafening. The sound of water drops echoed, creating an ominous melody. I continued walking, each step more difficult than the last. The cave deepened, the tunnels narrowed, and the feeling of claustrophobia increased. It was then that I saw it. At the bottom of the cave, there was an ancient altar, covered in symbols and bones, and upon the altar a figure was lying. My heart almost stopped when I recognized João. I ran to him, my heart beating wildly. John! I shouted, shaking him. His eyes slowly opened and he looked at me with an expression of confusion and fear. Mateus? Is that really you? He murmured, voice weak. Yes, it's me. I'm going to get you out of here. Before I could lift João, an invisible force threw me against the cave wall. The Guardian was back, his eyes glowing with an evil light. You found your brother, he said, approaching slowly. But he can't leave here. He is part of the forest now. I struggled to get up, the pain throbbing through my body. I won't let you take my brother. The Guardian laughed, a cold, cruel sound. You have no choice. The forest takes what it wants. I looked at Juong, who was trying to get up, but he looked too weak. I knew I needed to do something. I grabbed the knife and with a cry of despair attacked the Guardian. He moved with supernatural speed, dodging the blow and throwing me against the wall again. The pain was unbearable, but I couldn't give up. I stood up again, the knife firmly in my hand. I won't let you win. The Guardian advanced and I prepared for the worst. But then, something unexpected happened. The whispering voices became louder stronger. Shadowy figures began to emerge from the shadows surrounding the Guardian. He looked around, perplexed. No, this cannot be happening, he muttered as the figures advanced. I took advantage of the distraction and ran to Juan, helping him to get up. Come on, we need to get out of here. With effort, we managed to get out of the cave, the shadowy figures still surrounding the Guardian. We ran through the forest, the ominous sounds chasing us but there was something different. The forest felt less oppressive, like it was losing its power. Finally, we reached the edge of the forest. The moonlight enveloped us and I breathed a sigh of relief. I looked at Juan, who was still weak, but alive. We achieved. I turned to the forest one last time. The shadows seemed to dissipate and silence returned. He knew the guardian had been defeated, but the forest still held its secrets. My journey was not yet over. He needed to ensure that Montenegro was safe, that the Wailing Forest didn't claim any more lives. The story was far from over, and I, Matthew, was determined to face whatever darkness came, bringing light and peace to those lost in the shadows. The peace we felt upon leaving the forest was ephemeral. Although we defeated the Guardian, 
I knew that the Wailing Forest still hid terrible secrets. Zhuang was safe now, but his recovery was slow, and the trauma of what he had faced left deep scars. As I helped my brother get back on his feet, a new sense of uneasiness grew within me. The forest didn't seem completely pacified. Something was still there, something that required more than courage to confront. Zhuang started to tell me what he remembered. The details were fragmentary but disturbing. He spoke of strange rituals, of creatures that seemed to come out of nightmares and of a sinister force that controlled the forest. As I listened, I began to understand that the Guardian was not true evil, but merely a servant of something much older and more powerful. Something that was still there, waiting. I decided I needed to return to the forest, this time more prepared. I spoke to the few villagers who dared to talk about Montenegro's dark past and discovered that, centuries ago, an ancient cult had established itself there, performing dark rituals to summon entities from another dimension. The Weeping Forest was their sacred site, and the disappearances were sacrifices to appease these entities. Before leaving again, I prepared myself better. I summoned the bravest and most willing villagers to help, and together we organized a plan to explore the forest and face whatever was there. We carried flashlights, weapons, and protective amulets, hoping that these items would give us a chance against the evil that lived in those shadows. On the appointed night, we returned to the entrance to the forest. The group was nervous, but determined. The full moon lit the way, and the whispers began to echo again. Louder than before, I took a deep breath and took the first step, leading the group into the oppressive darkness of the forest. The atmosphere was even heavier than before. The tree branches felt like claws trying to trap us, and the dense fog made it difficult to see more than a few meters ahead. We advanced slowly, alert for any sign of danger. The whispers turned into harrowing screams, and I felt the pressure building in my mind, trying to disorient me. We followed the path that Zhuang and I had taken before, but this time, the forest seemed to be in constant movement, changing all the time. We reached the clearing where I found the Guardian, but it was now empty except for stones covered in symbols. The air was charged with electricity, and we knew something was about to happen. It was then that the ground began to shake. A low, guttural sound echoed through the forest, and a gigantic figure emerged from the shadows. It was a hideous creature, with pale skin and eyes that glowed like hot coals. Its claws were sharp, and its mouth was full of pointy teeth. The true evil that controlled the forest was before us. The creature advanced and panic took over the group. Some ran, others were paralyzed with fear. I screamed at them to stay calm, but it was hard not to be swallowed up in terror. The creature roared, a sound that made my blood run cold, and attacked with surprising speed I raised the flashlight, trying to blind her with the light, but it seemed to have no effect. Stay together! Don't let them separate us! I shouted, trying to organize the group. The creature's claws ripped through the air and we barely managed to dodge. The confrontation was desperate, and we began to realize that our common weapons would not be enough to stop that evil being. It was then that I remembered protective amulets. I took mine and walked forward, shouting ancient words I had learned from local legends. The creature hesitated, as if the words had some effect on it. The villagers followed my example, reciting the words and raising their amulets. The creature roared again, this time in pain, and backed away slightly. We took advantage of the opportunity and continued advancing, forcing the creature to retreat further and further. The forest around us seemed to react, the whispers turning into screams of agony. Every step was a struggle, but we were determined to reach the heart of the forest, where we believed we could end the evil once and for all. Finally, we came to a large ancient tree in the center of a circle of stones. The tree seemed to pulse with black energy and the roots moved like serpents. We knew that this was the epicenter of evil. The creature followed us there, but was visibly weakened by our amulets and words of power. We formed a circle around the tree, reciting the ancient words in unison. The energy in the air was almost unbearable, but we couldn't stop. The creature roared one last time and attacked with all the strength it had left. 
At the last moment, one of the villagers, an elderly man named Silverio, threw himself at the creature, holding tightly to his amulet. The light shone brightly, and the creature exploded in a cloud of shadows and screams. The ancient tree began to tremble, and the roots retracted. We continued reciting the words until the black energy completely disappeared. The forest was silent, a silence that had seemed unattainable for so long. We knew that evil had been defeated, at least for now. As we returned to the village, tired but relieved, the feeling of imminent danger began to fade. Montenegro was finally at peace, and the whispers in the forest became just a memory. Juan was safe, and I knew we had achieved more than just our survival. We had freed the forest from the evil that had haunted it for centuries. But even with peace restored, the memory of the horrors we faced would continue to haunt us. We knew that the Wailing Forest held more secrets than we could imagine, and that evil could one day return. Montenegro's story was far from over, and I, Matthew, would always be vigilant, ready to face any darkness that dared to arise again. The forest, now silent, seemed to breathe in relief. But a part of me knew that, somewhere in the shadows, something still waited. Something that, one day, could try to claim the peace we fought so hard to achieve. And when that day came, I would be ready to face it, with the courage that only true terror can forge. The days following our victory over the creature were strangely calm and unsettling. Juan was slowly recovering, but he still carried deep scars from what he had faced in the forest. I tried to maintain the appearance of normality, but something inside me didn't allow me to relax completely. The peace we felt upon returning seemed fragile, like a thin veil that could tear at any moment. During moonless nights, I would wake up in a cold sweat with my heart racing. I dreamed of shadows, of whispers and spectral figures that called me back to the forest. I knew something was still wrong. Something hadn't been completely resolved. My mind kept returning to the circle of stones and the ancient tree that pulsed with evil energy. One night, I woke up to a piercing scream. I jumped up and ran to Juan's room. He was sitting on the bed, eyes wide and breathing heavily. Mateus, they are back. They want me back, he whispered, his voice shaking with fear. I hugged my brother, trying to calm him, but I knew the terror he felt was real. Something was pulling him back and I needed to find out what it was. I decided I must return to the forest, alone this time, to face whatever was there. I prepared myself again, this time more carefully. I took not only the amulets, but also the ancient notes and symbols I had collected. I needed to be ready for anything. When I left the house, the night was strangely silent, the moon hidden by dark clouds. I walked to the edge of the forest, feeling the weight of fate on my shoulders. The entrance to the forest felt different, darker and more oppressive than before. The air was thick and the whispers began immediately, as if the forest itself was waiting for me. I advanced cautiously, eyes alert for any movement in the shadows. Every step was a challenge, every sound a test of my already frayed nerves. The forest felt alive, the branches moving as if they were watching me. The ground seemed to pulse beneath my feet, and the whispers became screams, mixed with macabre laughter that echoed around me. The feeling of being watched was intense, and I knew I wasn't alone. Finally, I reached the circle of stones again. The big tree was there, imposing and shadowy, but something was different. There were marks on the floor, as if something had been dragged. I approached cautiously, examining the place. It was then that I heard a sound behind me. I turned quickly, the flashlight shaking in my hand. A figure stood in the darkness, watching me. It was a woman, with a pale face and eyes that shone with an unearthly light. You're back, she said, her voice soft, but filled with a veiled threat. Who are you? I asked, trying to remain calm. I am the keeper of the forest's secrets. You shouldn't be here, she replied, taking a step forward. What are you looking for here, Mateus? I swallowed, feeling the tension increase. I want to free my brother from the terror that still haunts him. I want to end this once and for all. She laughed, 
a cold, lifeless sound. Do you think you can face the evil that inhabits this forest? Do you think you can free those who have already been claimed? Her eyes glittered with a malice that made me shudder. I'll do whatever it takes, I replied, trying to sound confident. Show me how to end this. The Guardian took another step forward, her face now illuminated by the flashlight. There is a ritual, a final sacrifice, but it won't be easy. The forest demands a high price to be appeased. What is the price? I asked, feeling a knot form in my stomach. One life for another. You must offer something of equal value to what you want to save. Your own life, or someone else's, she said, her eyes fixed on mine. Are you willing to pay that price? The idea of sacrificing my own life terrified me, but I knew I couldn't let Juan continue to suffer. Yes, I replied, voice firm. I am willing to. The Guardian smiled, a cold, calculating smile. Then follow me, she said, turning and beginning to walk towards the darkness. I followed her, feeling each step as if it were leading me to my own end. She guided me to a hidden cave, even deeper and darker than the previous one. Inside was an ancient altar covered in symbols I recognized from my research. The Guardian began reciting words in a language I didn't understand, and the cave seemed to vibrate with energy. Lie down on the altar, she ordered, and I obeyed, feeling the cold of the stones against my skin. The ritual will begin now. You must remain still no matter what happens. I lay down on the altar, my eyes fixed on the ceiling of the cave. I felt energy building around me, a feeling of absolute dread. The guardian continued reciting the words, and the shadows in the cave began to move, taking on indistinct and terrifying shapes. Suddenly, I felt a sharp pain in my chest, as if something was being ripped out of me. I screamed, but forced myself to remain still. The shadows around me danced frantically, and the cave seemed to close in on me. The pain was unbearable, but I knew I had to resist. After what seemed like hours of agony, the Guardian finally stopped reciting the words. The energy in the cave began to diminish, and the shadows retreated. The pain also began to disappear, leaving me weak and exhausted. The Guardian approached, looking at me with an unreadable expression. You made your choice, Matthew. The evil has been contained, but the price has been paid, she said, and her figure began to disappear into the darkness. I lay on the altar, trying to catch my breath. I knew that something had changed, that the evil had in fact been contained, but the price, the pain he felt, was a constant reminder that peace is never achieved without sacrifice. I slowly got up and left the cave, the night still dark and silent around me. I returned to Montenegro, feeling a mixture of relief and sadness. Juan was awake when I arrived, his eyes shining with new hope. Matthew, did you make it? He asked, voice full of emotion. Yes, Juan, we did it, I replied, hugging him. But a part of me knew that the battle against the darkness was never truly over. The weeping forest was silent, but it knew that evil could return one day. As I looked out at the forest from my window, I felt a new determination grow within me. I would always be vigilant, always ready to protect those I love. The story of Montenegro and the weeping forest was far from over, but he knew that when evil returned, he would be ready to face it again. The weeks after my return were tensely calm. Juan was recovering well, but the trauma of what we faced in the forest remained. The village of Montenegro, although relieved, still carried a shadow of fear. We knew the evil had been contained, but the feeling of imminent danger persisted. Everyone tried to get on with their lives, but the silence of the forest was a constant reminder that something could still happen. One night, as I was reviewing my notes for any clues I might have overlooked, I heard a strange sound coming from outside. It was a low, guttural sound that seemed to resonate through the walls of the house. I slowly stood up and grabbed my flashlight and knife, feeling a chill run down my spine. I went out to investigate. The night was dark and silent, the moon covered by heavy clouds. 
I walked to the edge of the forest where the sound seemed to be stronger. As I got closer, I saw something that made me freeze in fear. The great tree, the one pulsing with evil energy in the center of the circle of stones, was once again emitting a dim, ominous light. The air around her seemed to vibrate with a dark energy, and the whispers returned, louder and more distressing than before. Mateus, come. We are waiting. The whispers were almost deafening, and the feeling of being pulled back into the darkness was irresistible. I knew I needed to act quickly. I ran back to the village, waking up the bravest villagers and explaining what was happening. We organized a group, and with flashlights and amulets in hand, we headed back into the forest to face whatever was there. The walk through the forest was even more oppressive than before. The trees seemed to close in around us, and the whispers turned into screams and macabre laughter. The fear was palpable, but we were determined to put an end to the evil once and for all. We reached the circle of stones, where the great tree now glowed brightly, emitting a black light that seemed to swallow the darkness itself. In the center of the circle, the keeper of the forest's secrets stood, her face illuminated by the sinister light. You should never have come back, she said, her voice echoing with unearthly strength. Matthew's sacrifice weakened evil, but did not destroy it. Now, he is stronger than ever. Before we could react, the Guardian raised her hands, and the dark energy around the tree intensified. Shadowy figures began to emerge from the ground, their eyes glowing with an ominous red light. They were the souls of those the forest had claimed, now transformed into monstrous creatures. Form a circle. Protect yourselves with amulets, I shouted, trying to stay calm. The group quickly gathered, raising their amulets as we recited the words of protection. The creatures advanced, but the light from the amulets kept them at bay, at least for now. You can't stop them, Matthew. They are part of the forest now, the Guardian said, her voice thick with contempt. I do not believe you. Let's get this over with, I replied, trying to hide the fear in my voice. With a cry of defiance, I charged toward the Guardian, the knife firmly in my hand. The creatures tried to stop me, but the group maintained the circle of protection. When I got close to the Guardian, she attacked me with supernatural strength, throwing me against one of the stones in the circle. Pain exploded through my body, but I forced myself to get up. You can't win, she said, approaching slowly. The forest will always take what it wants. I remembered the ritual, the ancient words. I took out my amulet and started reciting the words of power again. The guardian hesitated and the creatures around us began to retreat. The light from the amulets shined brighter and the black energy around the tree began to weaken. No! This cannot happen! shouted the guardian, her voice full of panic. With one last effort I ran toward the tree, holding the amulet against the pulsing trunk. The light intensified and a deafening scream echoed through the forest. The shadows were consumed by light, and the Guardian let out a scream of agony as her form disintegrated. The tree shook violently, and the black light began to disappear. The monstrous creatures retreated, dissolving into shadows that dissipated into the air. The energy in the forest diminished, and a heavy silence took over the environment. I fell to my knees, exhausted but relieved. The group approached, helping me to my feet. We did it, Mateus said Silverio, his face reflecting everyone's relief. We put an end to evil. I looked around, feeling a peace I hadn't experienced in a long time. The forest was finally silent, the shadows dispelled and the whispers silenced. I knew we had won, but at a high cost. We waited a moment in silence, honoring those the forest had claimed. We returned to Montenegro, where news of our victory quickly spread. The villagers were relieved, but also aware that the peace we had won needed to be protected. Juan, upon seeing me, ran to hug me, tears of relief in his eyes. You did it, Matthew. You saved us. I smiled, but I knew the battle against the darkness was never truly over. The evil had been contained, but memories of the horrors we faced would continue to haunt us. I looked at the forest one last time, feeling a new determination rise within me. The weeping forest was silent,
but I knew that evil could return one day. I would always be vigilant, always ready to protect those I love. The story of Montenegro and the Weeping Forest was far from over, but as long as there was courage and determination, we would be ready to face any darkness that dared to arise again.